won our life. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just want to let you know that we're going to wait a few moments to let um, uh, attendees join in. Just to let you know, we're waiting a few moments so that attendees can uh, assemble. I will begin uh, just now and like to say good morning everybody and uh, thank you all very much for attending today. Just before we start the, um, the webinar itself, I'd like to say that very unfortunately we had planned to have live ESL interpretation um, as usual this morning but you to a sad family bereavement of one of the interpretation team, um, we are not able to provide that today. However, we will very shortly after the event provide ESL interpretation on a recording of the whole proceedings. And um, one of our interpreters, one of the interpreters for today who was scheduled, Amanda, uh, will explain more in a short video here now. Thank you very much, Amanda, and good morning to everybody. Welcome and thank you so much for attending today for the launch of Women's Aid Annual, Women's Aid's Annual Impact Report 2021. Uh, we have a very large uh, audience 
uh, which includes women's aid staff, volunteers and board members, staff of other domestic violence refuges and support services right across the country. We have survivors of domestic abuse, bereaved family members due to domestic homicide, members of the Urthus, of Angarda Fiacona, of the legal profession, staff from the Department of Justice, representatives from TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency, and staff from other organisations who support women and children affected by domestic violence, including homelessness services, children's organisations, medical and social work professionals. And we also, of course, have with us members of the media. I think that, you know, today will be an event which will be extremely informative and I hope will help to progress the very important conversation that we need to have here about how we as a society can prevent and address the impact of domestic abuse uh, in Ireland. And um, there is no doubt of the, I think in anybody's mind, of the need for this, and not least as the report uh, demonstrates very clearly that we are looking at staggering levels of abuse and brutal forms of abuse that are being experienced by women and children in homes and relationships uh, in our country. We have an impressive panel of speakers, including the Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, TD, Sarah Benson, CEO of Women's Aid, Gillian Dennehy, Maternity Project Coordinator with Women's Aid, and Professor Louise Crowley from University College Cork. And I should say that I um, am Alva Smith and I am Chair of Women's Aid. I'm delighted to be moderating today's discussion. I have always believed, and I believe it very strongly at present, that creating spaces to share information and insights is absolutely vital and fundamental to creating positive and urgent change. And we desperately need urgent action for that change. A little bit of housekeeping uh, before we move into the business of the morning. The webinar is being recorded and we will email you a link to it very shortly. We have a very packed agenda to get through, but there is some time towards the end for questions and answers. And you will see, according to the normal drill, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A member of staff will be keeping an eye on your comments and your questions. And we will pose uh, a number of those, as many as we've time for, to the panelists before we finish. And can I remind you that again, you know the drill, please use the hashtag on social media today. The hashtag is hashtag zero tolerance. I would now uh, like to introduce our very uh, first speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Minister for Justice, Helen uh, McEntee. Minister McEntee has led the development of the government's third national domestic sexual and gender-based violence strategy. And the final publication of this, together with an implementation plan, is due in the coming days. Due to a prior commitment, a long-standing commitment, Minister McEntee has sent her apologies as she can't join us this morning. Uh, uh, she can't join us live, but she did want to address the, um, the launch of the impact report. She did want to address us, so she has made a short video, which we're going to show now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to join you this morning. I want to thank Sarah Benson and indeed her wider team of staff and volunteers for inviting me to launch the latest Women's Aid Impact Report. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the invaluable work that Women's Aid has been doing for almost five decades now. It is truly an amazing body of work. I know that there are staff from other domestic violence refuges and support services from across the country in attendance and I want you to be in no doubt as to my appreciation for the important and indeed the selfless work that each and every one of you do. Your collective contribution not only provides vital support services for those that need them but it also shines a light on the often hidden consequences of domestic violence. Special word of course 
uh, to our survivors of domestic abuse who are attending today, as well as to family members sadly bereaved because of domestic homicide. The names and lives behind these tragic events will never be forgotten and continue to inspire our push for improvements. Ours is a shared goal, I am clear and I am a firm believer of that, a society where there is zero tolerance for domestic violence against women and girls. And as Minister, I will closely consider how the information in this latest report can be used by Government to reinforce and inform our policies and our legislation in this area. Every year the Women's Aid Impact Report illustrates the reality facing thousands of women and children subjected to domestic violence in this country. We can never become hardened or desensitised to this grim truth. Instead, we must pause and reflect and think of the people, think of the women and children behind these headline figures. And the figures for last year again are unfortunately very stark. Some 26,906 contacts to women's aid during which 33,831 disclosures of abuse against women and children were made. These include 4,707 cases of physical abuse against women and 1,104 cases of sexual abuse against women. Behind these figures are women and children whose lives have been absolutely devastated. The pandemic has only exacerbated the problem and the threat of domestic abuse for many, and it's devastating to see such figures uh, and these kind of figures overall. With Gather initiatives like Operation Freesov and the Still Here Awareness campaign, we were able to get an important message of support out to victims of domestic violence and to show that this heinous crime was and is being approached with the gravity and the resources required. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Women's Aid for their involvement in developing and communicating the Still Here message. I also wanted to acknowledge two other projects my department is currently funding for Women's Aid. One is the extension to a full-time service of the Domestic Abuse Information Drop-In Service for women at Dolphin House Family Law Court. The other is the High Risk Support Project, which is a unique collaboration between Women's Aid and On Garda Síochána to deliver an enhanced response to women identified at high risk of serious harm or homicide. This is rolling out nationwide this year. While acknowledging these are only two areas of your work, I want to thank everyone for their continued work on these projects and indeed elsewhere. I know Women's Aid launched a new strategic plan recently with the vision of an equal Ireland with zero tolerance of domestic abuse and all other forms of violence against women. As you may know, I'm currently leading work on a new whole of government strategy to combat domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. The strategy has rightly been developed in partnership with the sector to ensure that it is targeted, that it is comprehensive and effective in achieving all of the goals set out. The overall goal it will set is of course zero tolerance in our society of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. The strategy and the accompanying action plan is currently being finalised for submission to government in light of submissions received in the very final consultative phase with the sector and indeed with the public. The strategy and the aims will set out a very high level of ambition and the accompanying action plan will set out how each of these aims will be achieved, which departments and agencies are responsible for them and the time frame for delivery. This, I believe, will ensure that our work to reach our shared goal is targeted, is precise and is deliverable. I've said on a number of occasions that this new strategy will be and must be the most ambitious to date and I intend to deliver on that. As we continue our work, the input we receive from Women's Aid and indeed all of our partner organisations is absolutely crucial in helping us identify the changes that we need to make. The collaborative approach taken to developing the new strategy has been overwhelmingly positive and I really do look forward to continuing to working closely with each and every one of you in this sector as we deliver on it. We want to ensure that those who engage with the system, that they are treated with respect, with dignity and empathy by everyone that they come in contact with from the very outset. And I know that respect, dignity and empathy are the cornerstone of what Women's Aid does. My sincere thanks to you for this important work. Now, I, 
our thanks to uh, Minister McEntee for, for those words, those strong words of support and a very, very clear understanding of and, and very real commitment to achieving zero tolerance. And of course, we look forward to the publication of the national strategy and in particular to the imminent implementation of the action plan. Thank you again, uh, Minister. I am now very pleased to introduce uh, our next speaker for today, uh, who really doesn't need uh, an introduction. That is our wonderful CEO, uh, Sarah Benson. As CEO, she has been um, at the helm of Women's Aid since 2021, just when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, was continuing to present huge challenges for Women's Aid and, of course, to women who were subjected to fear and abuse in their own homes. Such very difficult times we have been going through. Sarah and her team continue to innovate and to adapt to meet women's needs in these desperately acute circumstances. So Sarah is going to share with us today details of the contacts and the disclosures made to our frontline services last year. And very crucially, she will also outline where Women's Aid believes we need to focus our energies and attention now to combat domestic abuse. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Ava. Um, and my sincere thanks also to the Minister for her kind words and for her continuing support and that of her colleagues in the Department of Justice. Um, very warm welcome to all of my fellow speakers today, whom we're very honoured to have joined us for the launch of the Women's Aid Annual Report for 2021. Uh, also big hello and thank you to everyone who has logged in with us this morning. I can see we have a great group attending and we are also live streaming on Facebook. So um, as Alva's already acknowledged, there's a wonderful variety of colleagues and stakeholders and you know interested individuals joining us today. And it is brilliant to have you all join us for what we hope is an informative but possibly sobering and jarring um, but ultimately we hope optimistic session today because really one of the things we know more than ever before is that it, it is going to take all of us an absolutely multidisciplinary cross-sectoral and whole community response to tackle abuse and violence effectively and for the long term. I also want to acknowledge that there will be some in the audience who are directly impacted by this issue, and I would encourage you to reach out to the National Free Phone Helpline anytime, day or night, uh, if we can be a support uh, simply as a listening ear or to give you information or indeed connect you to your local domestic violence support service uh, who are all around the country and just uh, acknowledging again that uh, quite a, a number are joining us today. Um, some of you may have had a chance to view the report that we're launching today, uh, or you can download it after the session. It's now live on our website, uh, or you can find the link through our Facebook and social media accounts. And in that, you can read about all the areas of our frontline work, as well as our new projects, our training services, our public campaigns, and our advocacy for social equality, because we work in a multifaceted way to try and get to what Alva has alluded to, that, that vision of a society where we have zero tolerance of all forms of male violence against women and girls. I'm personally so very proud of the work of the Women's Aid team, including our incredible staff, uh, our volunteers, and of course, our board members um, for all of the organization's achievements in 2021. And I would like to take this opportunity to offer my sincerest thanks to each and every one of them, everyone who works tirelessly together every day in many different ways to listen, to believe and support women, to keep our organization in good shape and to help shape a safer society for women and children. Thank you all. Um, there's still so much work to do though and we're also so grateful to our statutory, our non-statutory and our public supporters for their continuing commitment to us and to our work. We are fully committed to honouring this support and to maintaining and innovating our vital services and collaborating with others to deliver positive impact. In the last year, we've initiated a new, uh, a number of new and innovative projects, which uh, we mentioned in the report, in order to increase that positive impact on women at risk of or subjected to abuse. I'm going to play you a short video now, which just gives you a snapshot of our frontline impact during 2021 and where we believe we need to focus our energies to help combat domestic abuse. 
2021 shone a spotlight on the issue of violence against women. Last year, there were 26,906 contacts made with women's aid, including 28,096 disclosures of emotional, physical, sexual and economic abuse against women. We also heard 5,735 disclosures of abuse against children. Behind these figures are women in our communities whose lives have been devastated by abuse. Her husband is coming home and spitting on her, knowing she is terrified of catching COVID-19. She has serious health issues. She disclosed that she has been forced to have sex by her partner when she doesn't want to. He has complete control of her finances. Her ex is threatening to upload intimate photos of her on the internet. She feels like her world is caving in. All too often, women feel failed by the system. A woman rang for support after being in court. Her protection application was turned down. She said the judge told her to go home and talk to her husband to sort things out. Today, a woman's ex-partner broke into her home and assaulted her. She has called a guardi and has been waiting for two hours for them to arrive. She is simply terrified. Every woman has the right to be safe. The Istanbul Convention sets out what we need to achieve a society with a zero tolerance to all forms of male violence against women. We need to promote gender equality from a young age, enhanced resources for specialist domestic and sexual violence services, effective laws, policies and systems informed by survivors of domestic abuse, an improved criminal justice system that protects women and children and holds perpetrators meaningfully to account. If we do this, we will ultimately create a more equal and safe society for everyone, men and women alike. Women's Aid will continue working tirelessly to support women subjected to domestic abuse and to work towards a society where no woman has to live in fear. Thanks for being here at all hours to talk with me. I've told my family what's going on now and it's such a relief. The Guardi have arrested my ex and have been great. It's hard, but I'm not feeling so alone anymore. Women's Aid. Listening. Believing. Supporting. So those statistics are shocking. Those are just our statistics in one year. The numbers of women reaching out to Women's Aid for support during a single year is staggering, but they are just the tip of the iceberg of the number of women, children who are suffering at the hands of those closest to them and who need protection and support. One in four women in Ireland are targeted during their lifetime by current or former partners. And as our own research has shown, a shocking one in five will have been abused by the time they are just 25 years old, many for the first time as teenagers in their earliest intimate relationships. It is something we recognise that also impacts on men and LGBT uh, communities, but this is a heavily gendered issue. And the equivalent figure for our young people is one in 11 young men compared to that one in five young women. Behind each statistic we talk about are women we know, women in our families, in our circle of friends, in our workplaces and at the school gates. Women who are trying to protect and keep themselves and their children safe in the face of unrelenting and devastating abuse. National Free Phone Helpline team responded to 21,126 contacts providing an unprecedented 8,863 hours of direct support. So an overall increase in talk time of 8%. Helpline calls were considerably longer on average and women's needs were often more complex. We experienced more calls in the quietest and darkest hours of the night. Women were reaching out for support, understanding and the space to make sense of what their partners or ex-partners were doing to them. There were also 5,780 contacts with our face-to-face -face services in the Greater Dublin area. 
women seeking support through our drop-in court information and support service, our one-to-one advocacy, court accompaniment, and the high-risk support project. And all of these services remain in constant demand in 2022. And I think I speak for all of the domestic violence services in saying that the demand for our services goes unabated. Contacts to all our services in 2021 revealed such deep levels of distress and fear and isolation exacerbated by the COVID-19 emergency. Women told us about broad and brutal patterns of behaviour that they were subjected to by those who were supposed to care for and love them. Domestic abuse and coercive control is just that. It is a pattern of multiple tactics that erode the victims, survivors, emotional, physical, sexual, and economic safety and well being. Women reported to us assaults with weapons, constant surveillance and monitoring, relentless put downs and humiliations, the taking and sharing of intimate images online, complete control over all financial expenditure, sexual assault, rape, and being threatened with their. Are their, are their children's lives. The impacts on these women are chilling and they range from exhaustion, isolation and hopelessness, to feeling brutalized and wounded, suffering miscarriages, a feeling of a loss of identity and suicide ideation, constant hypervigilance, post-traumatic stress disorder, poverty, and for some homelessness. And it is just heartbreaking to listen to women describe their concern for their children who have witnessed and overheard and experienced the abuse against themselves, as well as those direct emotional, physical and sexual abuses um, that they have witnessed and the children have experienced. In 2021, there were 5,735 disclosures of abuse of children made to women's aid, including children being beaten with weapons, sexual abuse, coercive control, constant and degrading verbal abuse, being hurt when the abuser was trying to attack their mother and abuse during neglect or, or neglect during custody and access visits. Aside from the horrific and often long lasting impacts of the abuse itself, there are so many challenges today for those who are subjected to abuse. The family and criminal law systems that are creaking at the seams, creating lengthy, protracted and traumatizing delays for women navigating both criminal and civil law systems, sometimes both at the same time. The housing crisis and the dearth of appropriate specialist accommodation provision for survivors of abuse, limit options for a safe home for many. The negative impact of COVID-19 on family incomes, taken especially in conjunction with deliberate economic abuse can compound and exacerbate acute and frightening situations for many thousands of women and children across the country. Through generous state and public support, Women's Aid endeavoured not just to sustain our vital services, but also to innovate in 2021 to keep meeting needs where they are presenting to us. We have expanded our cover for services, initiated pilot projects to target vulnerable women accessing maternity services, and increased our efforts to shine a light on the underreported and under-resourced area of support and prevention of intimate relationship abuse amongst young people. We've collaborated on new national public campaigns and developed new specialist training and support, particularly to employers committed to making their workplaces a supportive environment for employees suffering domestic abuse. We continue to commit to services and activities that recognize the intersectional barriers and challenges for some women and our services continue to have access for interpretation in over 200 languages. We are currently rolling out awareness videos in nine languages, including Irish Sign Language and representing English speaking women from a range of ages and ethnic backgrounds. We are commissioning research in partnership with disabled women activists and Trinity College Dublin to shine a light on the distinct experiences of intimate abuse um, experienced by disabled women and expanding the reach of our two into you work to engage migrant, ethnic minority and LGBT young people and much, much more. Like I said, so much work to do. We also delivered over €400,000 of practical support directly to women and their children all over Ireland through emergency funds and resources designed to help contribute to the re reducing the risk of poverty, to enhancing children's lives and improving home security post-separation, uh, among other needs that help us to redress the impact of abuse and help women to maintain their dignity. I want to acknowledge the collaboration with our wonderful colleagues in the domestic violence sector for helping us distribute these funds to those who most needed them through grants that we made to 30 local services across the country nationwide. 
In 2022, we are investing further in research and collaborative projects to broaden our impact towards ending domestic, sexual and all forms of gender based violence, as well as remaining a vital lifeline for those in need of help. As the Minister has noted, the government has now also completed a vital new third national domestic, sexual and gender based violence strategy with the final publication due in the coming days in conjunction with an implementation action plan. This plan for the first time seeks to address the, four, address the four key components that will help us to truly eradicate male violence against women, prevention, protection, prosecution, and coordinated policy. There is good practice and there are positive experiences that women report as they navigate many systems, but all too often these are not consistent, are under pressure and under resourced, as the testimony from our video indicates. There's already work underway to formalize strategies to improve the family law system, to improve survivors' experience of the criminal system, to introduce stalking and strangulation legislation, and to enact legislation for a statutory paid domestic violence leave for workers. This is all excellent progress, but it is still all in planning or just in process. It will require focus, coordination, and crucially investment from government to see the ambitions of this important plan realized. Today, there's an increased recognition in Irish society that domestic abuse and all forms of male violence against women are not women's issues, but an issue for men. Recent and terrible events have again highlighted the persistent issues with misogyny and structural gender inequality, which are both a cause and a consequence of male violence against women. This comes into stark focus every time a woman loses her life through male violence. As the organization maintaining the Femicide Watch for Ireland, Women's Aid recorded the names of a further seven women who died in violent circumstances during 2021. Already in 2022, we have recorded the names of five more women whose families are left reeling from their needless loss. While we need to consider ways to prevent and target public safety for all, it remains the case that the most dangerous place for women statistically is their own home. And the nightmare of violence and abuse most commonly will be at the hands of a current or former intimate male partner. The public conversation must continue to focus on how women, men and all people can collaborate to create positive and lasting positive change that will benefit everyone in Irish society. We're moving beyond COVID-19, but we are entering a new phase of global instability and potential economic crisis. Today, the message that Women's Aid are putting out there is that these things must neither distract nor dissuade us from taking the urgent action required. Instead, it's even more vital that we grasp the opportunities that we have to effect a real and lasting change to achieve equality for all and aim end male violence against women. And that's something that we need to work towards together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a very sobering presentation in, in terms of the, the numbers and the nature of the calls and the disclosures and the encounters with women in great distress over the, the, the past year, over 2021. But at the same time, I think that your emphasis on what is being done positively, both by Women's Aid, but also um, uh, by other services and at, at government level is really encouraging. And of course, it is a very crucial time for us for, to, to to be emphasizing the importance of this urgent action that we do really have to get on with it now. Um, it gives me very great pleasure now to introduce Gillian Dennehy, who is in fact going to speak about one of our uh, more recent new innovative projects. Gillian is the Maternity Project Coordinator with Women's Aid. Uh, her previous role with the organisation was a services manager, where of course she was overseeing the crucial face-to-face -face frontline services. Gillian has worked for various nonprofits in the violence against women and girls sector for over 14 years, both in the UK and in Ireland. And it is precisely that expertise and skill that has contributed to the success of the new Women's Aid Maternity Project, a three year pilot program which began last year. It's an excellent example of an innovation to increase protection for women subjected to domestic abuse during pregnancy. 
the pilot project enhances the maternity hospital's response to domestic abuse through a jointly created training, awareness and referral programme. And I am now delighted to ask Gillian to share your insights, Gillian, into the first year of the maternity project. Thanks very much, Alva, uh, for that great introduction. Um, oh. Sorry, <laughs> I am um, stopped there. One second there now. I just have to share my screen for some reason. Apologies. Oh, okay. Stopped there. Apologies. My screen doesn't seem to be. Um, do, you, do you have your Do you have your PowerPoint open? We, we, we're just seeing your whole. Yeah, screen. it's it's yeah. I know. I, uh, it's open. Yes, it's open, and it's exactly the way we we practiced. Okay, so um, just, if you click the share screen button, then just pick the PowerPoint from the grid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, sorry, I did that, but I, I don't know what was happening there. So apologies for that. Right. Okay. So um, apologies for that. Thanks again, Alvar, for the introduction. Um, so you all just saw my little boy there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, we, I just wanted to first of all uh, talk about why Women's Aid uh, was so driven um, really to, to, for this project, to, to begin this, uh, to, to get this project off the ground in 2021. What were our drivers? What was our passion behind this project? Um, you know, we can start off with the um, first assumption, key assumption that uh, in the words of Ellen Pence um, from the Dulles Coordinated C Community Response Project is that no one single agency can respond to domestic violence and abuse alone. So Women's Aid, we really, really understand that. And we really strongly believe that uh, us as an expert in domestic violence and abuse, we need to work together in our community with other voluntary sector organizations, with other private sector organizations and statutory sector organizations. And we do this really, really well and um, with the high risk support project. We also now with our, our new employer engagement project was going really well. And now as well with our maternity project where we are working, collaborating um, with uh, very strongly with the health sector. Um, and together we can be a real force in the community to respond to domestic violence and abuse. And the next key um, hypothesis for this project is that domestic violence and abuse is a public health issue. We believe that very strongly in women's age. We know that domestic violence and abuse does not stop during pregnancy. Um, we, in our 2021 um, statistics, 152 women disclosed to our helpline that they experienced domestic abuse during pregnancy. And 41 women uh, disclosed that they had actually experienced miscarriage because of that abuse. So pregnancy and postpartum are periods of high risk for women experiencing domestic abuse. And it has serious health impacts on the woman and the unborn child. As I said, miscarriage, it can also lead to premature labour and birth, low birth weight for gestational age, delays in accessing care, depression, anxiety. We at Women's Aid know this because of research, but also because of what women tell us, what they disclose to us. And it was something that really, really concerned us um, and we wanted to do something about it. In addition, pregnancy is a unique window of opportunity. And pregnancy is a time when, you know, we have these women who are experiencing quite uh, controlling behaviours, they can be quite isolated in their communities. And suddenly, because of pregnancy, they have increased contact with health providers. As uh, anyone who's gone through maternity care will know, you know, you're coming into contact with maternity hospitals, public health nurses, GPs, you've got that increased contact. And in fact, Siobhan O'Brien Green's research from 2020 um, tells us that actually women who experience domestic violence and abuse have actually more contact um, with um, health providers during pregnancy than women who aren't experiencing domestic violence abuse during pregnancy. And that is because of those harmful um, impacts I just um, outlined there for you that they may experience during pregnancy. Um, so, and also it is a time, pregnancy can be, it can be a time when people are generally, you know, kind of exploring their options, you know, reevaluating their lives. Um, and this is, well, maybe as well, they start looking at uh, reevaluating the relationship. Um, when they think about the, the, the child um, that is going to be coming into their lives. In addition, um, health professionals, you know, what we've really seen from this project um, and research tells us that health professionals really do see it as their role to ask and respond to domestic violence and abuse. Through this project, we've seen the commitment and passion of the maternity hospitals and, and the clinical staff that we have collaborated and worked with. Um, however, they tell us 
Um, and research tells us as well that they really need the training and education around asking and responding because they want to they want to be able to respond, ask and respond in an effective way, in a safe way, and create that safe environment for women and children. So therefore, that's why all these things have led us to go, yes, there is that need. There is this need for the Women's Aid Maternity Project, and we wanted to provide plug in that gap, like we do with so many of our projects. So I'm just going to talk now through some of the key components of the um, of the project. So one of the key components is that cl collaboration element. It is that we, you know, we couldn't do this without our four key hospital partners: the Coombe Women and Infants University Hospital, the Returnda Hospital, the National Maternity Hospital, affectionately known as Hollis Street, and Ireland South, South Women and Infants Directorate, and um, um, primarily Cork University Maternity Hospital. These are key key partners um, and they're very big, have shown just commitment and passion for this project from the start. In addition, um, we have an external advisory group which meets for the project, which meets um, around twice a year, but also have a lot of bilateral communication with the, the, the members representative on that advisory group. And that includes key partners such as the HSC social inclusion team, uh, the women's health Task Force from the Department of Health, TUSLA, the Office of National Midwifery Services Directorate, NWIP, the National Women's Infant and Health Programme. We then also have, you know, very key, strong um, voluntary um, partners such as CORJA, uh, which work with uh, the migrant communi community around health advocacy. We also have AIMS, which is a great, you know, advocacy uh, group for patients um, going through um, maternity care. And of course, we have Pavi Point, um, which represents um, the Roma and um, Roma and traveller communities. So we're really, really delighted to have such a, a extensive expertise on our external advisory group for this project as well, and really enriches the project. In addition, we also have an internal advisory group in our, you know, which really lends the spirit of collaboration. So we, you know, we're drawing resources from our training team, from our comms team, from our services team, and of course our, our, our dynamic uh, CEO Sarah Benson as well. So you know, we they, everyone's generously sharing their um, their energy and their commitment to this project to get make sure this project is a success. Um, so another key component, of course, is is training. So as I said, you know, we've been told, um, you know, and we, we've learned that, you know, training is key, um, key uh, to increase confidence to, to ask and respond effectively to domestic abuse and maternity hospitals. And what we felt with this project, what it was key was that we didn't just go, okay, here's what we think you should learn. That we, it really was about engaging with the hospitals, collaborating and co-designing a training program um, and the content and piloting it together. And really a key element to the training component is evaluation. So what we've done is we've commissioned um, independent evaluators, the Centre for Effective Services, who are, are going to be um, evaluating key, our key components of the project, in particular the training element. So we will, we will be piloting the training in quarter three of this year. Um, we will be then you know, evaluating as we go. We'll have an interim report next summer. Um, and then from then, you know, the final report will be in the uh, summer of 2024. Awareness, another key strand of the project, key component is that the awareness strand. So we wanted to create awareness, not just of, you know, what I spoke of, that domestic violence in, um, during pregnancy is common. Um, indeed, more common than preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. We wanted to create that awareness, not just to, to staff, but also to patients um, who are accessing the, to the general public but also of the pathways of support internally that are there. So the four leading hospitals the project have a great you know, expertise in their medical social work team who are there to respond, to, respond to, to women experiencing domestic abuse, but also of course, the key external specialist services in the communities um, that are there as well. And of course, our national domestic violence helpline that is there 24 hours a day for both professionals and all women experiencing domestic violence and abuse. And the fourth, fourth key component is referral. So we, we have a, a brilliant dynamic and um, specialist outreach um, service, support service worker, um, Kira Kenny, um, who is a named worker for the maternity hospitals. What is unique about this project is that she, the eligibility for this service is that the woman has to be um, accessing maternity care um, with uh, one of the three Dublin hospitals. 
Um, and so what Kira is doing as well is, is like building knowledge and expertise as well, because she's working with a very specific group of women who are accessing maternity care, working with women who are pregnant, who are you know, going through uh, postpartum, experience pregnancy loss, um, are accessing abortion services, all these different women that, you know, Kira it has been supporting uh, through the project. A key aspect of this specialist outreach service, what we wanted um, to, to make ensure was that there was accessibility for women accessing the service. And what we know from research um, is that survivors who access support from a health-based domestic abuse support worker had experienced abuse for an average of six fewer months than survivors engaged for a local community-based service. So therefore, what we mean by this is that those, you know, if we have um, specialist support services that are really doing that outreach work, reaching out to health services in the community, women will not waste time, you know, looking uh, for, for that um, specialist support. They will get that support quicker and access it quicker. And Siobhan O'Brien Green's research in 2020 also, um, uh, you know, supports this, um, this, this, this premise as well. So what is the impact um, of this project? from June 2021 to now. So in terms of this training strand, as I say, the spirit of this project is collaboration, is engagement. So I've, I have held seven facilitated sessions with the four key um, maternity hospitals. And I have been delighted that we have had such commitment and passion um, from um, these hospitals. We've had multidisciplinary engagement with 43 clinical staff, ranging from obstetricians um, to midwives, um, to physiotherapists and of course medical social workers. So we've had I've had all this great input and I've put to them, well, what is you know the key, what does a successful training program look like for you? What is the content that you want to see? What do you think people need to learn? How best do you think you need to learn that? So these were really, really successful facilitation sessions. Um, that, that we've held that have allowed me then to design a training program that has actually been signed off now by the four hospitals. I'm now currently working on the content for this training program. The key aspects, as well, just I just wanted to outline some of the key aspects of the training program that I, you know, the input I, I, I got from the maternity hospitals was that, you know, really is key is that this this domestic violence and abuse training program for maternity hospital staff needs to be accessible it needs to be flexible we're talking about very very busy hospital staff who've gone through an awful lot in the last few years with the COVID-19 and with the cyber attacks and they need this to be accessible flexible they need to be able to make this work as part of their busy working and um, working lives um, and also they need protected time. It needs to come from above to say domestic violence and abuse matters. This is what it is, it's common. So we need to give a priority and we are giving you time to do this. It needs to be a phase program. As I said, you know, three hour blocks of time, a half a day is not gonna work for busy maternity staff. It needs to be one hour accessible blocks of time. And um, in addition, it needs to be multidisciplinary. So what the, the hospital clinical staff said they want you know they want social workers in the room they want obstetricians in the room they want midwives in the room they want the physiotherapists in the room they want everyone in the room together learning from each other um, and so therefore that will also create this collaborative approach um, and also will create that kind of understanding that we are a hospital that are together responding to domestic violence and abuse also blended learning that will allow that flexibility so for example digital learning and online learning uh, via platforms like zoom but also face to face was something that came up strongly that, that the hospital staff know we want face to face we want that um learning experience that's how where the real skill sessions and learning works and it needs to be motivating it needs to be different from other um the training out there to, uh, so that staff are motivated to do this and want to learn and see the benefit of this so we're, you know, we're really excited that we will be piloting this training um, this year, the later a quarter, the, the last quarter of this year. And then we will be, as I said, evaluating it. Um, and there will be an interim report and then a final report in 2024. So watch this space. We're really excited to share all the, um, the outcomes from this training program. The other key strand, as I mentioned, is an awareness. And in 2021, for the 16 days, we launched a really successful awareness um, campaign. And this again, um, highlighted the, the spirit of the project of that collaborative approach. Um, and we had many focus groups with each of the four hospital, um, maternity hospitals and some regional hospitals as well. And we you know, wanted to keep it simple messages 
um, and wanted to target at women, staff and the general public. So this is, for an example, a poster um, which was up on the toilets and um, which should be up on the toilets still of maternity hospital on the back doors of the toilets where women can see it. And, and it has, you know, the 10 common signs of domestic abuse with a pregnancy um, focus and emphasis so women can, can relate to it about their experience. This was a pull up that was at the door during the 16 of the, the four hospitals during the 16 days. Um, and this is um, really, again, you know, the simple messages of that 16 days campaign, which was that, the, that domestic violence and abuse in pregnancy is more common than you think. And the hospital staff are there to support you, provide, you know, and also what was key about this awareness campaign as well was that united front. At the end of each of the posted materials, you had the four um, logos of each of the hospitals um, represented. Um, so that was really, really great to, to see that, you know, we're together, we're here to support you. Um, maternity of hospitals understand and our environment of safety to disclose. Um, we also did a, six, uh, a tailored 16 facts for 16 days on uh, domestic abuse and pregnancy. Um, and this was directed at women and staff, you know, highlighting the key issues um, um, of it and, and the health impacts as well that are there. Um, and then as well, we there was a lot on social media during the 16 days from the four hospitals. Again, we, you know, we had tweets um, that each of the four hospitals sent out at the same time. And one of the, uh, just an example of one of these tweets is working in partnership to listen, believe and support women experiencing domestic abuse. And it was just really, really great to see that collaborative par partnership approach and uh, that we're all, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet and women can see that. I would see here is an example of University Hospital Cork. You can see the materials in action there. I think, we, you know, we all agree that they, they, they look great. For the outreach service, as I said, we have a dynamic outreach worker, um, Kira Kenny. Um, she is from 21st of May, she started taking referrals. Um, to, uh, we have some statistics here from 21st of May to December 2021, and more statistics, of course, on our impact report. What was interesting is that majority of the women who access our um, the outreach service had mental health needs. And we know that you know women who experience domestic abuse will are more likely to experience depression and of course um you know then with pregnancy you have that added layer as well and concerns about postpartum and postnatal um depression as well as that uh, as well so can, that can uh, exacerbate things with, for women um women disclose physical abuse during pregnancy sexual abuse and 90 percent disclose emotional abuse so when we think about emotional abuse here we're talking about you know um undermining women controlling behaviors and so here you could might see you know delays in accessing maternity care etc and Kira, you know, did sterling work during this time. She had 151 support sessions with women. So that's one-to-one -one support with men and listening to them, believing them, validating them, and asking them, what support do you think, you know, would you, what are your options? You know, here are some options um, and empowering women to, to look at their options. Um, and sometimes that could be just listening to the woman. Um, sometimes women wanted, you know, to, to get saved, to, to leave the relationship. Um, and so she did, you know, 14 court accompaniments during that time, and that would be um, obtaining safety orders, barring orders, um, to, to, to ask the abuser, to, to the court asking the abuser to leave the home. Um, it could be looking at her finance, supporting her own finances, it could be advocacy to the guards about breaches of orders. Um, it could also be, you know, advocating to housing for, in terms of temporary accommodation and um, accessing refuges, really, really sterling work with this vulnerable group of women. A one woman story, let's let's call this woman Amy. She was experiencing severe coercive control, uh, which included, you know, you know, keys being taken off her, um, you know, really, really severe control um, by the abuser. She was referred into our project by the medical social work team. And Kira had great successful support and engagement with this woman. Um, she supported this woman to obtain a one-year bearing order, which said that the abuser could not uh, no longer come to their home. Women's Aid provided her with support from our security fund, which meant then she could change the locks, which meant that if he came to the house, he couldn't use the key he had taken off her. In addition to that, um, we were able to, you know, she, Amy still had a you know, baby that was, was pending that was coming and she a lot. On top of all this court, um, attending court, she also think about, okay, what do I need for, for my baby? And, you know, she was struggling to, to, to get things she needed. So we were able to provide her uh, with it from our emergency needs fund. And in addition to that, because she was um, deemed high risk from this abuser, um, our, our unique um, high risk support project are able to support Amy um, with a high enhanced response from the Gardaí. So it really just shows you that wraparound support that a woman can, can, can uh, um, obtain from accessing the support from our maternity outreach service.
I just want to conclude on this quote that you know, this is what it's all about. Um, honestly, I feel like such a weight has been lifted off me and I can finally focus on the important things now. It's all such a relief and finally I can put it all behind me. Thank you so much for everything you've done. So that's a, a woman communicating to Kira, um, you know, and it just, it just epitomizes what this project is about. It's about, you know, women and children being safer. It's about creating that environment of safety within hospitals so that women can disclose, they can obtain the support they need. And then women and children can live a life free of abuse and she can enjoy that time with her newborn baby when um, free from abuse and fear. Um, so thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, do give me an email, gillian.ne at womensaid.ie. Also do visit our uh, webpage, Women's Aid Maternity Project, where you can download any materials that I referred to earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian, for that really very interesting account of this still very new project, which is already doing such uh, good work. And I don't think anybody could fail to be moved by that final quote, and particularly with the photograph. Um, thank you. And thank you for all the work that you and the team are doing on, on this project. Um, I uh, can, and also, by the way, thank you for reminding people to put in questions and comments into the chat. We really encourage everybody to do that. We won't have a lot of time for Q&A, but it's still very interesting and important for us to see um, questions and uh, comments. But now I would uh, like to introduce our uh, final panellist uh, today, and I am extremely pleased to do so. Our final panellist is Professor Louise Crowley, who is Professor in Family Law at uh, UCC. She is a national voice on intimate partner violence, having published very widely on the adequacy of legal responses to the challenges of gender-based violence. She works with service providers and state agencies to highlight the need for greater targeted investment investment in service provision. At UCC, Louise has developed the campus-wide bystander intervention initiative, which seeks to educate and empower staff and students to challenge the normalization of sexual abuse and to recognize uh, their role as bystanders to effect change and bring about a new normal of safety and respect. Mm -hmm. In March, Louise launched an um, Irish Research Council funded bystander intervention programme at second level, which is now being rolled out in 45 schools nationwide, which I think is pretty incredible. Well done, Louise. And she joins us today to share with us the details of this really um, super initiative to prevent gender based violence. Louise, you're very welcome. Thank you, Alva, and thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank Sarah for the invitation, but also to thank all at Women's Aid for the critical work that is being done uh, to support women and children um, in the context of, of domestic and intimate partner abuse. I mean, the work of Women's Aid is phenomenal, and Gillian's example um, in her presentation there is just, I suppose, ty typifies Women's Aid capacity and ambition to support and respond to the needs of women, women and girls. Um, so I want to talk to you today about an issue that, that Sarah mentioned in her presentation, and that is what I regard as all of society's responsibility to be aware of and to address issues of sexual harassment, hostility and violence where they come upon them as bystanders. So I suppose I begin with the point that as a society, not only do we have the right to challenge objectionable behaviours and standards, but we can also positively assert standards of respect and behaviour that should form the bedrock of the society in which we all want to reside and to engage. And I believe that education is where this must begin. Awareness, recognition, social responsibility and the skills to act supported by a shared appetite and commitment for better are the factors necessary to develop, harness and affect real cultural change. In the wake of extreme acts of gender-based violence, the normalization of everyday hostility, harassment and violence becomes apparent as women and girls share their experiences, their stories of discomfort, intimidation and harassment. Every woman has a story. And we need to better understand the boundaries of, unaccept of acceptable behavior to recognize the breadth of the acts that constitute sexual harassment and violence by developing an awareness 
of how it manifests through spoken words, social media, text communications, unwanted advances, inappropriate comments, and of course, through unwanted physical attention in its many unacceptable and too often devastating forms. Whilst few would claim to condone such unwanted acts, the silence of bystanders to such behavior serves to indicate a false consensus of acceptability, implicitly delivering an equally false sense of permission to the perpetrators to behave this way, which in turn can normalize the conduct and invariably result in the escalation of abuse by some. The overarching aim of the UCC Bystander Intervention Program is to cultivate a culture of zero tolerance of all forms of unacceptable behavior by empowering participants to actively contribute to a safe, supportive environment. Specifically, by developing their capacity to affect change through pro-social behavior and attitudes, the program commits contributes to a visible commitment to the delivery of a safer learning and working environment, which impacts positively upon the broader social context. A key aspect of this approach is the development of a progressive, effective culture around the issues of respect and consent, enhanced by an improved engagement with and among staff and students at UCC. This includes an exploration of the broad scope of what constitutes sexual harassment and violence, noting the dangers of normalizing such acts and the importance of a capacity to recognize them in order for a sense of responsibility to make an intervention to be triggered. And so to explain the UCC Bystander Intervention Program, which was developed from the UK Intervention Initiative created by Fenton and Mott and funded by Public Health England, is delivered over four online and one in-person workshop. The online training is self-directed and taken by participants in their own time. The content addresses their understanding of the bystander role and their pro-social capacities to address sexual harassment and violence. Firstly, participants learn about bystander theory. Why do we intervene? And what stopped us from, at times from choosing to intervene? Developing their bystander capacities firstly requires an ability to recognize problematic behavior. So we work to develop their understanding of the crucial issues of consent, unsolicited and unwelcome sexual advances and violence, sexual harassment, intimate image-based abuse, and the danger of accepting the normalization of any such conduct. Thus, the first four workshops educate, upskill, and empower participants to actively mandate and affect cultural change amongst their peers in an environment which has exposed their collective rejection of such behavior, which up until now was not often comfortably asserted. It exposes the incredible impact that an effective intervention can have, which might seem small to them in the moment, but may make an incredible difference to the person who benefits from that intervention. In the final in-person workshop, participants are presented with a series of fictional scenarios Everyone is identified as a vehicle for change with potential to identify problematic behavior and to have the capacity to choose how to actively intervene. This approach provides a safe environment for participants to act as pro-social bystanders to verbalize their reaction that so often stay silent because of intervention inhibition or the fear of retaliation or social isolation. And it allows them to better understand the significance and impact of a safe and timely intervention. So Tom, if you would share my presentation now, I'm going to demonstrate some of the impact data from this program. So the next slide shares with you, um, um, and the next six slides in fact, will demonstrate the significant and meaningful enhancement of the participants' understanding of three key issues, what constitutes sexual harassment and violence, their realization of their role in challenging such behaviors on campus, and also their recognition of their capacity to make safe and effective interventions having completed the training. So the first two slides um, address the question of the participants' perception of their ability to do something about sexual harassment and violence at their institution, so in, in, at UCC. So in respect of participants in the year 2021, you'll see that before the workshop, 54% of people felt that they could make a difference and 44% felt they had a limited ability to make a difference. And so that's very positive and that they, they did sense they could do something about it. But following the completion of the training, 82% now believe that they could definitely make a difference, rising from 54. And 17 believe they had a limited capacity 
So that's a very significant improvement in terms of their ability, their sense that they can make a difference through their training and the use of their training. So the next slide is the same issue. We're dealing with the 21-22 data, Tom. So similar figures, we see the big jump from 59 to 77% in terms of those who believe they can make a difference with 22 also believing they can make a difference, albeit with limited capacity. The next slide again addresses the second question, which asks whether they believe they have a good understanding of what constitutes sexual harassment and, this, and violence. And this is really critical because too often behavior has become normalized in society and we can never make an intervention if we don't in the first place recognize the behavior as problematic. So we work very hard at bringing participants back to what I regard as Respect 101, getting to understand the range of forms of unacceptable behavior, the many ways in which sexual harassment, hostility, and violence can manifest. And so before the workshop, 69% were of the view that they did have a good understanding, but this shifted to 96% following completion of the training, that ability to recognize it in all its forms. And the remaining 3% did again have an understanding, albeit limited. So we believe that the training really does allow people to recognize all forms of sexual harassment and violence and to realize the range. And again, the next slide, provide similar data in respect of participants up until the end of April, 2022. Again, with 93% of participants post completion of the online training, being in a position to recognizing all forms of sexual harassment and violence. And then the final impact slide asks the question about their belief of their ability to intervene in a threatening or dangerous situation. So again, from 2021, 20, 27% of people before they took the training believe they did have a good ability with 50% believing they had a limited ability and 23% simply did not know how to intervene. And following completion of the training, 80% of the participants said they now had a good ability to intervene and the remaining 20% did also have an ability, albeit limited. No one now felt that they didn't know how to intervene. So clearly bystander intervention training is regarded, um, has the capacity to allow participants to not only recognize what unacceptable behavior looks like. It encourages and cultivates the sense of responsibility and ability to intervene and also develops the skills to do so. So I suppose just commenting on that approach of, I suppose, um, training people from, from the perspective of being a bystander rather than a survivor or indeed a perpetrator, I believe the bystander intervention is an effective shared response to addressing sexual violence because it places responsibility for changing the practice and culture on the entire community. The bystander approach represents a subtle shift away from directly focusing on the behavior of perpetrators and highlights individual and community capacity to develop strategies of violence protection, which seeks to shift attitudes through addressing the culture that creates and maintains the abuse. And if you go to the next slide, please, Tom, <clears throat> I thought it very useful to share with you some of the actions that our, our students and staff would have taken in the months following the training. So I just have three slides. Students were asked, participants were asked to comment on whether they had used the training in that three month period following completion of the program. So Tom, if you go to the next slide, please. So these are just, as I say, three slides with some feedback. So uh, have you made an intervention? So yes, I have seen a girl in an alley on her own looking very intoxicated. I was on a work break and notified my workplace so they knew where I was. I approached the girl and asked her if she was okay. She explained she was waiting for her parent. I asked if it was okay that I waited with her so she wasn't on her own and she seemed happy to have me there. I asked to ensure she knew I was there to help and to ensure she wasn't in a dangerous situation. Another participant, yes, I helped a girl find her friends on a night out where her friends were lost and some guy would not take no for an answer about going back with his mates. I'm six foot four so I simply stood in front of her and he scarpered like a startled dog. Next slide, Tom. Did you make an intervention? To my surprise, yes. The program certainly opened my eyes to the late night real world. Recently on St. Patrick's Day in Cork City Centre, I was with my partner at around 1 a.m. when we entered a takeaway where we noticed a young woman who looked quite drunk in a daze and was alone. Concerned, we decided to guide her past groups of young men to buy her some food. She sat and ate with us and once finished, we were able to signal a taxi for her. Thankfully, the driver was very understanding and did not hesitate, hesitate to take the woman home. I think before this program, I would have had a tendency to walk on and let someone else deal with the problem. 
Yes, a couple of weeks ago, I was cycling my children home from school near Kent train, Kent train station. There was a couple in their late twenties walking along very intoxicated. The man was being very aggressive to the woman. I didn't jump in as I was taking care of my children. So the most appropriate action was to call the guardy when I got home a few minutes later. I described, described the couple and the situation and they sent a car out. And so the final slide of feedback from our participants, although it wasn't a direct intervention, my friends and I walked a stranger home after a night out as she was alone. I felt this was a very responsible preventative measure. I've been more frank with my discomfort at a couple of my friends making sexist jokes. It's gone down well and they've copped on a bit. I recently had an opportunity to intervene in the way a friend of mine was talking about pronouns. I explained that pronouns and their correct use helps to validate and recognize an identity, further noting that he should be respectful of it. I probably would have let it go before, but I decided to tell him how he made me feel. Fortunately, he took this well and was open about it. And then finally, I wouldn't say it was much of an intervention, but I was coming back home from my shift when I saw a woman sitting in the curb and I felt it was dangerous to leave her. So I asked her whether everything was fine. Her phone was out of charge. I was able to help her by lending my phone for the call. I was able to both identify her need for help as well as successfully provide her with one. So I think that these quotes <clears throat> from our participants in terms of what they learned on the program and their ability to use those skills to intervene in a range of situations, both you know, threat perhaps of sexual violence, you know, recognizing vulnerability, and also interestingly, the, the piece about pronouns, recognizing that you know, harassment can come in so many forms and that there are opportunities to step in in a non-confrontational way, which can shift, shift attitudes as well as distracting, removing, or interrupting a troublesome situation. So rather than directly addressing either perpetrators or victims, framing all participants in the training as bystanders allows for a collective buy-in as to the shared capacity to recognize unacceptable or dangerous behavior and affect change. This approach encourages the calling out of what might otherwise be perceived as implicitly accepted behavior and identifies a new normal through the rejection of such behavior. The program remains inclusive in its engagement whilst recognizing the, the reality of the gendered nature of most sexual violence. Every student can be a pro-social bystander and every participant on this program can make a difference. And so finally, I just want to touch upon the second level program that Alva re uh, referenced in her introduction. We know that this is an issue that is prevalent among second level students. We know this because they come to us at third level and they've already experienced significant harm, serious acts of sexual violence and rape. And we know that there are dangerous behaviors also embedded in the behaviors of some people. We know from a 2021 report published by the Rape Crisis Network of Ireland, which explored the issue of sexual harassment amongst adolescents. It reported that 80% of those responding disclosed being subjected to some form of sexual harassment. But 83% had witnessed some form of sexual harassment. And 78% of respondents said that sexual harassment occurred within their peer community. There was also interesting data in terms of it occurring in school environments. 15% had personal experience of peer sexual harassment in school and 39% had witnessed incidents of sexual harassment involving their peers within school. So not only do we want to work with those who have experienced that sexual harassment, but very importantly, the large percentage who are witnessing it, who can become pro-social bystanders. And so as Alva mentioned, the Irish Research Council provided funding to me to develop a second level version of the bystander intervention program, which we have done. And it is aimed at senior cycle second level students particularly TY students, and it allows us to provide a safe classroom-based environment for them to identify inappropriate social interactions, and it enables the development of a visible pro-social culture of positivity and support within the schools. The funding was awarded uh, at the beginning, at the end of 2021. I had signed up seven schools in Cork City and County who had expressed interest in being part of the programme. But after the horrific events in Tullamore uh, and the murder of Ashing Murphy, we were contacted by 70 more schools who wanted to be involved. Ultimately, we trained 45 schools and 140 teachers in March of this year, and a number of schools have already rolled it out in May. The majority will roll it out in September, and we're having another session in UCC uh, to refresh them in early September. Very briefly, the program involves six in-class workshops addressing key issues faced by young people in modern society. Workshop one, addresses the, introduces the concept of being a bystander. Workshop two, concerns consent and healthy relationships. Workshop three, 
addresses social norms and sexual harassment. Workshop four considers online harassment and online image-based abuse. Workshop five explores how they can be affected by standards. And workshop six allows the students and teachers to reflect on the program and the key messages and learnings. And we're very grateful to Women's Aid and other organizations and the schools involved who have collaborated with us on the content. In terms of research, the students will uh, complete pre and post training questionnaires subject to parental consent, allowing us to gather with quantitative and qualitative uh, data to evaluate their learning. Additionally, we will have focus groups for willing and interested students to further interrogate their learning experience and to allow us to establish the potential for the broader rollout of the program across the country. And so we're very excited to have this opportunity to meet with young people and to share the training with them. Very briefly, and I'm conscious of time, just the last slide, um, last two slides, Tom, if you would, just some feedback from teachers. It's too early to have data from the students, but in terms of delivery, the teachers have really embraced the program. As you'll see on the slide, they've recognized that it brings to the classroom some of the lived reality that the students are experiencing. The students engaged in the walking debates, the group discussions, addressing the scenarios. Um, there has been a request for you know, a version for every year in secondary school, which you know, we might get to eventually, but particularly image-based sexual abuse for first years, which is very interesting. This is clearly a very challenging issue for all years in secondary school, but for first years in particular, as the teacher commented, they're so vulnerable because they are working so hard to establish friendships and they need to understand how to cope with it. And just the next slide there, Tom, some more interesting comments from teachers involved at a preliminary stage in terms of the delivery very eye-opening experience for the boys, especially when the girls were talking about sexual harassment that they experienced. Many debates on what constitutes harassment, most of the boys had only considered physical harm as harassment. I feel the boys benefited from this program the most. It allowed them to hear from their peers how truly uncomfortable it makes them and that the world's attitude towards sexual harassment has changed so much. And a real call for this program to be benefit, to be compulsory. And this is voiced from the students that it gives them the opportunity to have that safe space to discuss these issues. So I suppose to conclude, and you can stop sharing there, Tom, thanks a million. Interventions to highlight unacceptable behavior to challenge unwanted advances, both verbal and physical, will make a difference. Speaking up is never easy, but it isn't impossible. It is a challenging choice, but a crucial one. It is all of us who must now step up and speak out to our friends or to whomever we hear or see behaving in a way that threatens others. In particular, all men and boys must stand in solidarity with women and girls and learn to recognize all forms of unacceptable behavior, choosing to proactively engage to stop it, to end it. Each intervention can be both informative and transformative for the parties involved. Do this in every instance, and we have started a new conversation and identified the expectation of a new normal for all. If we are all informed enough and brave enough and feel likely to be supported by those around us, we can, through both individual and collective interventions, demand a new normal reject the apparent normalization of uncomfortable invasive behavior and those efforts can and will lead to broader change. So I am calling for you know, a consideration of developing this training for all sectors, private industry, public sector, art sector, educational institutions, major national sports organizations, as well as community groups, local sporting groups and youth clubs. And this is just in response to the tsunami of requests that I've received when this training and um, got some profile in January of this year, there is a clear appetite for this to bring it to the workplace and to bring it to all such organizations. And I think through considered and targeted consultation, it can be developed into a universal tool that can be adopted and adapted across all sectors and all age groups to provide online or blended training to enable the critical learning and associate conversations, which can and will affect change across Irish society. So thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to share this work with you all today. Ah. Thank you very much indeed, Louise. That was so interesting. And it really is uh, in, in, incredibly encouraging to see that this is actually now becoming integrated into schools programs. And I think that everybody would want to see that encouraging. It was really interesting in particular to, to see uh, the feedback. So thank you very much for such a great presentation. And indeed to all our panelists, thank you for your presentations. It has been very informative indeed. Although, of course, um, so sobering. 
uh, in what you're saying. Now we have a very short time for questions, so I'm going to rush straight away to put a few, uh, as many as I can possibly fit into the time. And Gillian, I'm going to start off with yourself. Um, what is the hope? For the maternity project after the pilot because I mean I, I and I think that's a really very good question because I would think everybody listening would want to think that this um uh, that this kind of program would be available for women all around the country so do you see what, what do you see in the future yes of course you know and that that is definitely our hope and um, so it's a pilot project so we wanted what we wanted to do is we were te you know testing out this training uh, with the four leading uh, biggest maternity hospitals in the country um and we uh, as i said we have uh, independent evaluators on board so we're evaluating uh, the training component the whole way along and other components of the project such as the outreach support um and the awareness campaign um, the awareness strand of the project. Then we will have a final report then in 2024. And we are then hoping that will generate huge interest um, in the project um, in you know funding in, in funders for long-term funding to say, yes, let's, you know, this just training program work. This, this project overall works. So having this outreach, specialist outreach connected to the maternity hospitals, this is something we need nationally. And then hopefully then, you know, we get the funding to roll this out uh, mainstream and to roll it out nationally to all 19 maternity hospitals. And, you know, we, Women's Aid, we have a lot, always have a lot of ambition. And our ambition, you know, we know that it's not just maternity hospitals that women um, access during maternity care, but also public health nurses, also GPs. You know, this is something we want to, you know, to go broader. It in the, the health sector um, but we have to start somewhere we want to get the the you know optimal um training program that works have the collaborative um, and get that you know get those recommendations and then move from there with those recommendations and hopefully the funding and interest to, to back that well thank you very much i mean it's obviously yeah. very important i mean it, it does seem to me that this is a theme it's one of the themes this morning that of course integrating those training and awareness programs in different directions is absolutely fundamental to achieving um the aims and the vision uh, that we have uh sarah can i go to you with the question now which is a very straightforward question and one i have to say i would have tended to be asking myself um are there any plans for reaching out specifically for older women experiencing domestic abuse sure i mean look <clears throat> i think it's really really important to say that we work with women and women contact us of all ages. Unfortunately, some of the older women who have uh, contacted and received support from us have um, been experiencing, been subjected to abuse for simply decades. And it can be an incredibly courageous and challenging thing for an older woman, um, perhaps, you know, at, at a certain point of her life uh, to, to reach out and get support. I think it's very, very important that we do not fall into the trap of suddenly talking about a concept of elder abuse for mm -hmm. women of uh, when they get to a certain age when it is still clearly domestic violence it, it to do so and research worryingly shows that that does happen it happens in a health setting and in other environments and the consequences for women can be extremely detrimental you can get into a medicalized model um rather than looking at actually you know the fact that you have coercive control and you may have added factors such as perhaps a uh, you know a caring dependency or uh, on either the either where the, the woman herself is responsible for caring for her abuser or vice versa and other complex needs uh, that responses have to be informed by recalling and, and, and keeping a focus on the dynamic of course of control. So um, I want to say our services are available to women of all ages. I do want to acknowledge that over the last couple of years, what we have looked to do, and I'll just thank you for this as well. I mentioned earlier, we're launching a range of videos it's around giving visibility to different women um and so uh, uh we have now our range of videos which have you know um uh, you know, women of different ethnicities and traveler women and older women, uh, all just presenting the same message of what abuse is, the fact that it's not your fault and the fact that there's services and supports there. So just giving more visibility so that women will say, OK, that woman looks like me. Therefore, the service must be for me, too. Well, thank, thank you very much. And Louise, I have a very quick one for yourself. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to keep uh, the response quite brief if possible. But how do you get past, you know, with the programme and with recruiting in a way and encouraging people to become involved? How do you get past 
that but so typical it's not all men uh, reaction uh, that we see uh, so often how, how do you deal with that yeah I mean that's a really good question but it is one that we have dealt with deliberately in fact that was the one change that we modified after delivering our pilot in our feedback from our male students was that it was a bit them be us so we have very much incorporated the recognition that it is first of all that it's not all men to say that out loud before anybody else gets a chance to say it recognizing yeah. actually that um, whilst it's not all men that it is all men who have a responsibility and we talk to male students through the online as well as the in-person piece about the power that men have to change to shift attitudes within their own peer groups and something that's really interesting is I did a podcast for Second Captain shortly after Ashley Murphy's murder yes. and I got a huge response from men not just in Ireland but beyond saying oh I get it now I was really defensive all week I felt I was under attack but now I see that it's not that people are saying it's my fault but it's my fault if I don't do something about it. And that's very much the narrative that we bring, that we're speaking to everybody as bystanders and appealing to their inner hero and their capacity to be the difference. And it's, a, it's incredible when the men who take the course realize the impact on their peers and then also recognize that they can do something about it. They become allies incredibly quickly. And I've seen it happen in front of my eyes and it's very powerful, but that narrative is really important. Th thank you. That's so, so interesting and so important, actually. Sarah, do you want to comment? Maybe do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I think just building on that, uh, one of the things like Women's Aid, we're nearly 50 years in operation, but like, like most, if not all grassroots organizations, you know, we've struggled always to meet the demands of, you know, those frontline services and others. But we are looking as part of our new strategic plan to, to try and engage and collaborate more with others around that kind of prevention, the, um, the bystander approach working in collaboration. And one of the key things we realize, you know, if we need to accelerate this work, we really, really need to get men on board as well as engaging boys themselves just in terms of so they can see their own authenticity and, and how diverse it can be and not part of a narrow stereotype of masculinity. So what I what one of the things that we are doing, I'll just put in a quick pitch for it, is we have um, Jackson Katz, who is one of the architects of the kind of bystander approach. Uh, very extensive experience engaging, particularly men in the nonviolent um mentors initiative he's worked with police with the military with sports teams and we have him uh, coming to trinity college in conjunction with our colleagues in trinity we're co-hosting an in-person live uh, interactive lecture with him on the 30th of june so um you can find out more through our social media what i would say is please share it with men <laughs> who you know. I know some members of our colleagues on Agar the Shia Kona are here as well. Like, you know, I think it's a real particular interest to those who are already engaging in the kind of domestic violence, uh, domestic abuse coordinators and things like that, uh, even our military as well. So um, please do share that out. I think it's gonna be a really, really important event, um, you know, to, to kind of help build that awareness of how we can all, um, you know, be part of that. Yeah, th thank you so much, Sarah. And indeed, it, it is about, in a way, shifting, uh, shifting the way, in, the way, in, the way in which we, we we speak about this whole issue and saying, look, it's a men's issue. It really is a men's issue, not just about women. And I think that this is a time when men are aware and increasingly aware that this is the time for them to be brave and courageous and to and ambitious and to stand up there and to to speak out and uh, thank you Louise and thank you to everybody in Women's Aid and in all the many other organizations for all the wonderful work that you're doing in that regard and in so many others so I wish we'd more time for questions unfortunately we don't so uh, I would like to first of all thank the minister and all our wonderful speakers this morning. Um, I mean, we, what we have heard has been, I think, uh, you know, very difficult. It, it has been a very tough year. We know this is a very, very tough issue. It's not going away, um, but we have to make it go away. Hearing those very stark numbers of increasingly complex or what sound like increasingly complex situations that women are facing, we know that there is an enormous amount of work to be done. We have heard a lot of that, what is going on currently being outlined. Um, we look forward to the national strategy and we look forward in particular to the imminent, immediate and urgent implementation of the action plan cannot stress that, I think, at the present time uh, too much. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to thank absolutely everybody involved right across the sector and all of the organisations and groups um, that Women's Aid uh, works with. And I think that the levels and degree of cooperation and connection between different services and providers and, and organizations and so on is growing stronger by the minute, by the day. And I think that that is so important, that this is something which has to be tackled on a whole community, whole society uh, level. And indeed, I do believe that that is something which really our, our backbones have been stiffened over the past couple of years with the pandemic and that that is happening. And, you know, it, it remains uh, to me to thank the tremendous work that goes on in women's aid day in, day out, day out, night in and night out. And the wonderful work which has been going on during that difficult year of 2021 to ensure that women's aid is there for those who are affected by violence and abuse when they seek help and support. I am so proud as chair of the organization of the, the excellence and the un, genuinely unstinting commitment of everyone uh, in Women's Aid. And I think that it is a real credit to the organization that it has continued to be innovative and creative and dynamic in thinking about how best and in working to find out the ways uh, in which it can best respond to the needs of women who are suffering and in distress. And always, always at the heart of the work that Women's Aid um, does is that sense that it is women who are at the centre of that work. So I want to say a very big and special thank you to our really wonderful CEO, to our incredible staff and to all the magnificent uh, volunteers, as well as to our dedicated board members. I can tell you we are actually a very hardworking board. Um, I also want to say thank you, which I've indicated earlier, but to say it again, thank you to all our partners in the community um, sector, voluntary, private, statutory and the lot. And um, to say to us all that I wish all of us well in the work that we have ahead in what is left of 2022. 20, I don't necessarily think we're looking at the easiest times uh, going ahead, but we are working together. We know what needs to be done. We are very determined and very passionate and very, very skilled. So I think that we will make progress. I would like to thank all of you for attending uh, this morning and to wish everybody uh, to keep well and keep working. Thank you all very much indeed.